I believe that the best uh, philosophy church ministry is to exemplify what Christ did. And so what did he do? He, he became what we are to make us what he is. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I, I become all things to all men that I might gain. And so a uh, good philosophy of ministry, how do we become who we're trying to reach? And so that's incarnational ministry. So uh, we have asked that all the ministries uh, have not only uh, uh, to be uh, inwardly focused, but be outwardly driven as well. And so I, I like what our medical ministry did. Our medical ministry saw need uh, at the Douglas Community Center. Uh, Brother Tarantine has verified it for me this morning that it continues to be a need. Uh, but the need in the community, believe it or not, was diapers. And he said, what do you say, brother? In two days, they were all gone. Uh, it's such a need. But Bible Baptist, thanks to you and thanks to the leadership of our medical ministry, Bible Baptist, we gave out 1,919 diapers and 3,132 wipes to needy families. So thank you, Bible Baptist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I want to thank our choir and men for your ministry in the nursing homes. I want to thank our Twilighters for ministry in the community. New Connections continues to lead out in our school to expand our life skills. And so we're pushing out and we want you to be a part of that. And so let's continue to do what we said in our vision statement that we want to be a pattern of good works in the community. We need to let that light shine. People need to taste that salt. And as I've learned that you can't, we can't always have ministry under a bushel basket. You have to let that light shine. And so ministry demands proximity. And so we will practice the ministry of the incarnation. And so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I want to thank our teachers again this morning. What a wonderful job. Uh, my bride and I, it's probably the first time in years I, I'm not teaching. And so I'm the greeter. My wife is helping me with greeting. And so when you come in, uh, you're gonna, you should get a greeting from your pastor and first lady. I'm telling you, get a sh handshake, a hug, something. And uh, we're going to greet you some kind of way. And so thank you. But it was good to see the people rolling in, rushing in. <laughs> Sister Herbert, they didn't want to be late for your class. They running in here from the parking lot. And, and, so, and uh, Dorothy's class was filled this morning. And praise God for all the kids. Thank you all. Sister Tarantine, thank you for the youth, Brother Atkins with the men, Brother Herbert is teaching fundamentals of the faith. If you need a, a, a fresh start in the fundamentals of the faith, uh, Deacon Herbert is teaching that. I want to thank Roy and Deanna who have taken on the new membership class. And so it's great to see our school in function again. And we give God all the honor, glory, and praise. Amen? Amen. But let's thank these teachers. Thank you. Wasn't, wasn't, where is he at now? I don't see him. I, I, it wasn't planned, but I want to thank uh, Keisha Sims and Jeff Monroe, who took on the babies. You know, we don't have, even have anyone to sign up for the nursery. And so they took that on. And so thank you, Brother Jeff Monroe. Thank you, <laughs> Sister Keisha Sims. We appreciate you. Also, the Twilighters Luncheon, Thanksgiving Luncheon, is Friday, November 15th. There's a sign-up sheet, 12 p.m. at the Black Rock. Again, this is for 62 and up. November 16th, our Gap Men's Fellowship will be uh, continuing, 10 a.m. in Room 3. Our Christmas program, Lord willing, will be December the 8th. More detailed information is coming soon. You've already heard about the Women's Ministry Breakfast coming up. On the 14th, our deacons will be giving a New Year's Eve breakfast, December 31st, from 10 to 12. And we will be announcing when the kitchen is done, we'd like to have a kitchen shower. Uh, most of the items we've had to discard, and so we need to replenish this brand new kitchen. And so uh, we also have an opportunity, New Connections of Kalamazoo Family Holiday Party, the 19th. 
Uh, New Connections is inviting the church to its holiday party, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. And also, they are taking on uh, Toys for Tots. And uh, usually when we think Toys for Tots, we forget that there are some older uh, children. And so, uh, if you'd like to minister to some of the older children, Bible Baptists, uh, there are 15 boys, 15 girls, uh, between the ages of 16 and 19, still children at home. And so if you'd like to participate in the Toys for Tots, um, please see or call uh, New Connections office phone and uh, get, uh, get uh, the information of how you can support that ministry as well. Well, we made it through another election. We made it through. I'm tired of hearing all of the condemnation of people. Man, it just seemed like it was different this year. More than I've ever heard uh, for both candidates, I, I tell you. And, and some of these people who they say what they did, some of the other offices, you know, this person bribed here. And I'm like, why are they in jail if they did all these things, you know? And uh, somehow we, we, we've got to maintain the dignity of what we do. And so what are you going to see us do? We're going to do exactly what the Bible tells us to do. We believe that the voting is similar to what we saw in the book of Acts when a choice had to be made to replace Judas Iscariot. Uh, they cast lots. But it wasn't a casting of lot into the uh, luck or chance. It was a casting of lots into the sovereignty of God. And they said, we're going to cast lots, Lord, show us which one you choose. And so ultimately, it is God who ruleth and reigneth. And so what does he ask us to do at the church? Well, the country has decided on its president. And so you'll be hearing prayers. As the Bible said, when Nero was killing Christians, he said, pray for those who are in authority, that we live peaceful lives. And that's what we're going to be doing, irregardless of what or who or how we voted. Uh, this is what has happened. And remember what we said. Caesar Augustus did not know when he, in authority, gave a decree that all the world should be taxed. And that brought Mary and Joseph to their city of origin, which was Bethlehem so that the scriptures would be fulfilled that the babe was to be born in Bethlehem. Who would have ever thought? I'm sure Caesar Augustus didn't say, let me make this decree so the baby would be born. What it shows is that through whatever the political process, even as the Lord told Pilate, you have no power at all except to be given from above. So let's just remember that he who sitteth in the heavens shall rule, and he rules in the kingdom of men. And that's where our hope, that's where our trust, that's where our faith is. But I want to thank all of you who also participated in the process. Paul said, I'm a Roman. Uh, he declared his citizenship. We see Jesus even saying that Caesar has some things. Look at the coin. And so we too, as uh, godly people, Christian people, we participate, but we trust in our Lord Jesus Christ who will never abdicate the throne. He's always sitting on the throne, and we thank God for that. So I just wanted to say that before we lose our minds and we um, think that the world is ending, uh, we're going to lead the country and all this kind of stuff. No, stay where you are. Just, just trust in God. Because uh, wherever you go, he's going to be there waiting on you. So we, that's what we're going to do, okay? All right, all right. I want to thank the Lord. We won't be here tomorrow. But uh, we do want to acknowledge, we've already put it on the marquee, I want all the men and women who have served in the United States forces, a military, in some capacity, men and women, would you stand at this time? Any men and women who have served, look around, Bible Baptists, these people have put their life on the line to protect our country. Tomorrow we officially honor Veterans Day. If you drive out this morning, you drove in, you see already on the marquee, we're saying that that marquee is ministering 
And so what we put out there is uh, we thank you veterans for your service and we appreciate that. So thank you men and women for uh, protecting my freedoms, our freedoms, by putting your life on the line to serve. Thank you, thank you so much. These are all my announcements and so we'll hear from the men, then we'll do a greeting. Woke up this morning with my mind, my mind was stayed on Jesus. Yes, I woke up this morning with my mind, stayed on the Lord God Almighty. I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'm walking, walking and talking with my mind. Mind was stayed on Jesus. Yes, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on the Lord God Almighty. I'm walking and talking with my mind. My mind was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'm singing and praising with my mind. Mind was stayed on Jesus. Yes, I'm singing and praising with my mind. Stayed on the Lord God Almighty. I'm singing and praising with my mind. Mind was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. You can love, love everybody, everybody with your mind. Your mind was stayed. On Jesus, you can love everybody with your mind. Stayed on the Lord God Almighty, you can love everybody with your mind. Your mind was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I woke up this morning with my mind. My mind was stayed. On Jesus, yes, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on the Lord God Almighty, I woke up this morning with my mind. My mind was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. The men also will be honoring uh, Brother Marvin Thompson, who is part of the men's chorus. They'll be also uh, singing in the service uh, tomorrow. So thank you, men. I also want to want to let you know that we have a new uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lavender. Would you stand up, please? Mr. and Mrs. Lavender. Thank you so much. Mr. and Mrs. Lavender. Yes. Uh, let's all stand. Let's greet each other this morning.
right, family? I was thinking about a little song. But I was told that uh, if I join this men's choir, didn't they do a wonderful job? Yeah, one job. They said my role will only be, hmm, that's going to be my only, but if that's it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. I'm going I'm to, every, every, every voice going to be, hmm. So good to have you in the service. I'm always thankful. You know, we have a young man named Tyrone. He's a student in the New Connections. So we had a parent night. And the parent night, um, oh, we maybe had maybe about 50 people. But we were able to share the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so uh, Tyrone's family is here. This is their third, is it the third Sunday? Third Sunday, so we'd like to welcome Tyrone Johnson family. Good, so glad to have you here this morning. Praise God. And also Robin is good. She's back with us again, New Connections bus driver, so glad to have you. Uh, enjoying, Sister Herbert, you know what she told me last week? I gotta go home do my homework. <laughs> so thank you, Sister Herbert. Appreciate you for all you're doing. Let's take our Bibles this morning Book of Genesis, chapter 37. Okay, thank you. Derek, come on up, my brother. Come right on. I was okay skipping this. Though. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh.
When the darkness appears And the night draws near And the day is past Past and gone At the river Lord I stand Guide my feet Hold to my hand Take my hand Precious Lord Lead me home Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. All right, children, you know what time it is. All children, kindergarten through fifth grade, it is now time for children's church. Sixth and twelfth grade, if you're not off the hook, it's your time as well for teen church. Visitors are also welcome as well. Let us all prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the words of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, servants, of children's church ministry and teen church ministry. Let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 37. We come to Roman numeral five in our series of Life Lessons from the Story of Joseph. We're about a week behind, but we're going to catch up here. The goal, the plan, if you remember, sends you the 10-point outline that the final number 10 will be promises uh, that were made to Joseph. And of course, don't leave these bones here. But take them up because the Lord is going to visit his people. And of course, that visitation will be the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the plan is to finish up either uh, before December or the first Sunday in December. And then we'll look at the incarnation, the birth of Christ. But we've come to number five, and that is the pit and the selling of Joseph, the fifth P. The pit and the selling of Joseph, verses 23 through 28. Follow along as I read Genesis chapter 37, 23 through 28. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. They took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. 
And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then they passed by Midian, knights and merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. And they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. We saw the consequences of polygamy that Jacob, five, excuse me, four babies' mamas. Though God, as we said, uh, permitted this, God's perfect will is monogamy. That you see it in the Genesis and Matthew's context on marriage. And though these are cultural things, yet God's word is always the standard. So the consequences we saw were two sisters competing for Jacob's love and his affection. Uh, They both get their handmaids involved so that the affection with the children. We saw favorable treatment of children from the favorable wife that uh, Jacob loved Rachel. And so he loved uh, the children that he and Rachel bore. And Joseph was the only one living that he shared because remember that when Benjamin was born, Rachel dies giving birth. And so it says that Jacob loved Joseph in his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Uh, We talked about the blended family issues that are so prevalent in our culture and even in our church. And I celebrate with you, all of you, uh, who have taken this on. You married, uh, your husband had children from another relationship, or a husband that has taken on a wife who have children from another relationship, or you've taken on your sibling's children, or other children, and, 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 and it's become what is called the step or this blended family. And the issue that we see is love. Because it keeps coming up, and so I salute, I celebrate, bless all of you who have tried to figure this out, and you're figuring this out. And even godly people, it's important to understand that it's not an easy thing for us to do, to try to to balance it out, to make sure that these children uh, who, who did not have a say in what happened, and so... We're trying to make sure that they see love and remembering birthdays and, and, and you see, and making sure graduations and all of these things. And, and sometimes there's always this feeling, well, you love them more. You love, it, it, it's always going to be that. But I celebrate you men. I celebrate you women. I celebrate you families that are trying to figure this out. Because remember, Holy Sarah, the Bible calls her holy, struggled after giving her husband permission to go into Hagar. But when Ishmael was born, she kicked that woman out the house. There was some real emotional issues. And I love the fact that the Holy Spirit does not leave these things out because these things are for our learning And for our example. And so we saw, though, that our key verse is that in 50, 20 of Genesis, that Joseph will get to the place when he looks at his birth and his life and he realized that it never takes him out of God's purpose, though. He said, you indeed 
meant all this for evil, but God meant it for good. And so we said from that, I, I thank God that uh, God's, God's greatness for your life is better than and stronger than the consequences of your birth. What God has for us as believers is a predestined plan that he's going to make us like Christ. And so all of the things are working together for that good. For, for them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And just like Joseph coming from all of that and yet God had a purpose for him. God has a purpose for you and all of you who are dealing with this God's purpose not your purpose, but God's purpose, that you be like his son, Jesus. And the church should be the example in society of blended family because we are families of the earth. We come from different people groups, but we are families of the earth. We all come from the same parents. And right here in the church, God says, no, no, no more Jew or Gentile, bond of free, you see. God has called us all together as one, and so we should be that example of blended family in the church. What happens, however, though one of the emotions that continues and increases is hatred. Oh, they hated their brother. We see this in 37, 5. Look at verse 5. It says, and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brother, and they hated him yet the more. Verse 8, and his brethren said to him, shall thou indeed reign over us, or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dream and for his words. You see, in the dreams, here is uh, not the youngest brother, Benjamin was, but the next one, the next youngest, telling all of the rest of the siblings that, you know what, y'all going to bow down to me one day. They hated him for that. But then he turned around and says to the parents, you, you're going to bow down as well. Imagine that, that somehow this youngster said he was 17 years old in the context that, uh, verse 2, he's 17 years old, and you telling your parents, you're going, y'all going to bow down, bow down. Absolutely, y'all going to be obeisance, giving obeisance to me. And uh, to the brethren, the same. Culturally speaking, it would have been Reuben, and then the oldest in succession, you see, who will be the one ruling the family in the absence of the parents. And so many cultures today, they acknowledge that older sibling. What we see in the narrative, Reuben takes on that role. He's going to take it a little bit more personal that these things have happened as big brother on his watch, the oldest son, that these things have happened. He understands what the firstborn means, what the responsibility is, but to have your youngest one say, no, I'm not bowing, you're you going to bow down to me. You can just get a sense of the feeling. Sometimes hatred in the Bible is used only to mean loving someone less. That's what Jesus meant when he says that he that hateth not his father or his mother or his wife, you see, or his children. Well, why would he call us to hate where other passages he tells us to love? In those contexts where hatred is used, it just means that we love less. That God simply tells us that there ought to be no one that we love more than him. And no parent no spouse, no child, no sibling should we ever love more than God. God is always the first love, and so hatred is used in that context. But in all the other contexts, it simply means that when I see a person, the word in the language is odious, that the person is odious to me, that the person is detestable, that when I see this person, I am disgusted. That they are abominable to me. They're, they're offensive to me. And that hatred festers to the point where they're going to kill their brother. 
That's exactly what we see in verses 18 through 22. Look at it with me in chapter 37. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him. Cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dream. What is amazing to me that they have a plan. This is premeditated. It's not going to be accidental. They... They have a bona fide plan to kill their brother. That we're going to, we're going to, first of all, we're going to kill him. Then we're going to hide his body. We're going to cast it into a pit. Then we're going to tell our daddy the story that some beast done ate him. And then guess what we're going to do? Then, then, then we're going to kill his dream by killing him. I mean, there's always people who want to kill the dream. Isn't that something? But you have to kill the dreamer kill the dream. And that's what they're saying. They said, let's kill him. and let, Let's see what happened to this dream. Uh, ain't nobody going to be able to bow down to him if he's dead. You see, we're going to kill the dream. A plan to slay their brothers. I, I believe they really meant this because if we consider contextually, think about this now, in the narrative of Genesis, Simeon and Levi have already committed mass killing. They've already committed the Shechemites because their one sister, Dinah, was raped. And not only do they kill the man that raped her, they kill the men associated with him. So Simeon and Levi have already killed some people. Not going to be any issue, you see, their brother. You see, their stepbrother. The blended brother. We, we're going to kill him. I think that this is something to be mindful of. Reuben, again, the oldest, we see his responsibility coming out in verse 21 and 22. Look at it with me together. And Reuben heard it. He delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands. You see, Reuben... Here's the plan. His thought is, let's, let's just get little brother out of their presence. Let's, let's get him out the way. Let, let's, let's just put him in the pit. But the goal was that he was looking, after a while, to go retrieve the brother and then take him back to father. You know, Because that would have been that responsibility. Older siblings, you all know this. Right? You got older brothers, you got younger brothers and sisters. All of us have had to take on that, whether we wanted it or not, to take on that responsibility of younger siblings, right? How many times you've gone home, parents, where's your brother? Where your sister at? Well, I didn't give birth to him, y'all did. No, you didn't. We, we didn't dare say that. But it became the responsibility of older siblings for younger siblings, right? That's what we did. We, it, was, it was our responsibility. And so uh, if they go back home to Jacob, the responsibility is going to be on Reuben. So let's not kill him. Let's, let's, let's put him in the pit. Because it says in verse 22, his goal was to get him back and then take him home to daddy. I think it's mindful to understand culturally the importance of the pit. I think we see it if we look carefully in the context in verse 24 in reference to the pit. It says where there was no water. You come down to verse 33, it's connected to the beast. 
Those were two primary reasons for the pit, particularly the pit in the wilderness, because it would be necessary to hold some water. From traveling, you see, water wasn't one of those things that we can take for granted. We, we go into the store now, you see, we sit, we got to decide, right? We got all these different, and some of us, we, we, we simply swear by the brand of water we drink, right? Sister Heather, isn't that right? Uh, <laughs> it's got to be Aquafina, you see? But to go to a place and be in a time and culture where uh, we have to think about this. And so pits were dug, which later in cities became cisterns. But if it rain, we've we got to capture the water. Some people have today barrels connected to drain pipes. And so that when water comes, we can, we can think about the usage of water. Water is precious, you see. Always has been, always will be. And so... A pit. No water in this pit, though, and then also the wild beasts to catch them, to capture them. They would fall into a pit. And this is where Joseph finds himself in the pit. Reuben's plan uh, gets his brother out of the way, and, and he has responsibility to, to dare. God, God has warned us about these feelings of hatred. And anger towards one another. There's nothing more hurting than to a spouse or a, a child or a parent or a friend to turn to you and say, I hate you. That's devastating to the emotions. Again, you're odious to me. That you are someone, you see, that is simply detestable when I think of you. You are, you are disgusting. You're abominable. You're offensive. And I, I hate you. God warns us about those feelings and emotions that we see here. Anger and hatred, according to Matthew 5... That, that I actually, unchecked, have the same potential as a murderer to which we see their plan to kill. Jesus would say, you have heard from them of old, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're guilty. Same feelings, you and I know that. Satan involvement, Paul warns us about angry. Be angry, but don't let it go into sin. He says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. But then he says, don't give place to the devil. Because we've already seen that he is a murderer from the beginning. In the beginning, we learned a lesson where we see with Cain. Cain, why are you angry with your brother? God told him, Cain, just do right. But if you don't, sin is lurking at that door. And it's not until the gospel, not until 1 John that we see Satan was on the other side of that door. And you think about it, he rides that emotion of hatred. He rides that emotion of anger. James tells Christian people that this is why you kill. This is why you war, because of lust and envy and hatred for one another. God warns us about these things that we see, these brothers want to kill him. But what they come up with is to just sell him. Verse 23 through 28, we see Judah's voice. This is the tribe that Jesus comes from. Verse 23, and it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat. His coat of many colors that was on him. It's, it's amazing that the coat becomes the physical representation of daddy's love. And what they do with that coat. They strip him of it. They're going to rip it up. They're going to put blood on it. And they're going to send it back to daddy. Here's the coat. Boom. But Judah. 
Verse 24, and they took him and cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. They sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with the camels and bearing spicery and balm and myrrh and going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother? Conceal his blood. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brethren were content. And then there passed by Midianites, merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. And they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they, they brought Joseph into Egypt. I, I believe that Reuben's influence, his older brother, he's the one, if you look at verse 22, that tells them, reminds them about not shedding blood. That's a key because that would go back to the oral tradition that he would have heard, you see, passed down through the, through the generations where, where the, the, the blood, you see, don't shed blood. This is what God had told Noah, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And don't shed that blood. If any man's blood be shed, so shall his blood be shed. To show the importance of life that that I find it amazing that Reuben would say this. Where would, he, where would he even get that from? He would get that from the oral tradition. Again, that's why the patriarchs live so long. And we often don't think of this. There, there, there's a fly up here. And uh, listen, if he go in my mouth, we're going to be a different, you're going to see some jumping and stuff up here. But <laughs> this blood was passed down. Think about it, think about it. Think about the, the, the age of the patriarchs. Uh, we forget that when Noah is born, Adam is still living. Uh, we forget that when Shem is born, you see, and Abraham is born, Shem is still living. Noah's son is still living when Abraham is born, who is the great-grandfather, you see, of Jacob. And his kids, they would have known through the oral tradition what God had said about don't shed the blood. So much and so they back up, we can't kill our brother. Let's sell him. You see, there was a desert economy. Egypt was the place, Africa, the place of merchants and merchandise. It was that kind of a economy through the desert. The desert economy existed and here these merchants come. Think about the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. Often we think of the people in your study trace where they come from. Ishmaelites would have been Abraham's child with Hagar, Ishmael. After Sarah dies, Abraham gets married again to Keturah. One of Keturah's sons is Midian. So the Ishmaelites and the Midianites that are mentioned here, these are Abraham's children's people. And they're merchants. Ishmaelites become the title for people who are desert merchants. They're called Ishmaelites. Midianites used interchangeably. And he is sold for 20 pieces of silver, you should not pass that so quickly because it's really not a lot of money. In fact, in the Deuteronomy law of God, he says that if a slave is damaged, the retribution is 30 pieces of silver. It's a value statement that not really worth a lot. And uh, in the story of Jesus, uh, Judas agrees for 30 pieces of silver. He's, he's putting a value on what he thinks of Jesus. 30 pieces of silver, slave, to be sold. And certainly, culturally, 
for political reasons. There were political prisoners that were sold into slavery. There were military prisoners who were captured at war, sold into slavery. There were also sold into slavery for financial reasons, that you got to work off your debt. You and I, we're more conditioned to that. If we have any debt today, the Bible says that the borrower is slave to the lender. But instead of him controlling, we have the freedom to go work and to pay off debt. But if we couldn't pay, then you would be in debtor's prison. You would go and perhaps be sold. You're going to have to work that off. But I find it amazing that the value that you could sell a human being. The whole idea of the sub-Saharian slave trade that went from sub-Saharian Africa to North Africa. Slaves in Africa, you see, Africans selling one another. And then you have the transatlantic slave trade where, you see, you have Europeans selling Africans to the islands of the Atlantic Ocean and then to the eastern seaboard selling people. And what is amazing today that that the slave sex trade produces $150 billion a year for young girls and women, and now even more young boys and men being sold today in sex slavery. Still a value statement that you put on a human being. God tells us about this, and uh, You and I as believers, we ought to be the examples in the culture today of valuing. We we should be the ones where the Bible just tells us, honor one another. That means the word is put a value on somebody. That I value you as my brother. I value you as my sister. And if we did more of that, you see, that uh, we would be examples to the world about the importance of the value that God's, you see, his image is on everybody. And so because of that, you have a value. It's not in the color of your skin, you see. It's the fact that you bear the image of God. Though with sin, yet you still bear that image. And so as husbands, we should, we should show our families, this is where it starts, in the home, that, that the home ought to know, you see, as a husband, that the husband is valued in the home. Absolutely. That men are valuable in the culture today. It's changing now because now you see the men, you see the emasculation of men is the issue. All the movies, everybody, all the men getting beat up. Oh, we getting beat up by women. Oh, my goodness. We just, whoo. Big man, six foot eight, little woman beating, it, beating him up, tying him up and so forth. Just, this is the culture today, you see. Wives ought to be honored in the home. Children ought to be honored. Parents ought to be honored. Brothers and sisters, we ought to honor one another. We ought to be able to show the world that, no, there's a value on your life. Neighbors, regardless of the color. I love, I love what Steve Bilko wrote, writes. He wrote during the time of apartheid in the preface of the book. is something by Desmond Tutu. How to be able to get these Africans, how to be able to get apartheid out the mind. He said it won't be because of color. It's going to be because a reminder that you are created in the image of God. Therefore, you have worth. You have values. The Nazis are the ones who came up with the statement, life unworthy of life. How can you make that determination? Programs and things, legislations don't do it. Hearts have to be changed, and our hearts have changed through Christ, and that's why we are to be the examples. You've had legislation that was written in 1863, and then in 1963, you've got from Lincoln to Linden, you've got a hundred-year period of time where 
Lyndon Johnson has to enforce what Lincoln legislated a hundred years before. That though the laws changed, the hearts didn't change. DEIs, though we celebrate diversity, equality, and inclusion, you see, equity and inclusion, that what we're trying to do is to present a behavior without a belief. That's why it don't work. People go back to doing the same thing. We're all about equity, you see, and value, and then you have an orientation, and all the managers come in, they all look the same. Not a lot changes. Though we got it posted, it got to be posted. So you can see it. Big, this is what we are. Well, we just simply need to recognize that no matter who you look at, they create an image of God. They got worth and value. Women have value. Men have value. And so we need to show it to the church. Reuben returns as we close. Reuben returns in, in verses 29 through 36. Again, he's the oldest child. Look at it. And Reuben returned into the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit. He rent his clothes. He returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat. They killed a kid of the goats, dipped the coat in blood, and they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. And he, he knew it, and he said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes, and he put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, I will go down into the grave until my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt and Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guards. The oldest brother comes, he, he looks, that's, that's where he put, he, he, he knew they put him in the pit. He come back and the pit is empty. What am I going to do? What, what am I going to say to daddy? What, what, what? And so what does he do? He shows all the signs of grief. He tore his clothes. Culturally, this was an expression. My heart is tore. So when you see the renting of the clothes, it is a physical expression of grief of the heart's condition. You see, Jacob will do the same thing. Rent his clothes. The sackcloth, the goat's hair that was put on, Rough, the dust, that's all I am, God. Grief is necessary, but it's difficult, isn't it? Wow. The thought that you've lost a sibling. Many of us, we've lost brothers and our sisters are gone. The grief of that. This, this, this father is going to think, his child, if you've lost a child, is going to, how, how can I show this? my heart? I was talking to one of the members here last week about a recent loss. I said, how are you feeling? She said, I feel like there's a big hole in my heart. Wow. You ever... Pay attention to people grieving. Listen to the words. Don't, don't be in a hurry to try to fix it. It's a part of life. It is. A necessary part. I look at Job's friends that uh, through all the suffering, they sat with him seven days, didn't say a word. They said because they saw the grief was so strong. 
But your presence, our presence means a lot. You see. But to join and walk on the journey with somebody, hold their hand, just to, I'm with you, I'm here. And just hear the language, kids grieving, what often has happened, the physical signs of grief that, boy, my heart is, my heart is torn open. What's amazing is that, remember, Jacob deceived his father with a goat, same thing. And now he's being deceived by his sons. He's thinking a child is lost. And so now they all try to comfort him. But he would not be comforted. Not one of the children could comfort him in the loss of his son Joseph. Joseph is then resold to Potiphar. That will bring us to our sixth P, Potiphar. But I want to close in verse 39, chapter 39, 1 and 2, and then we'll pray. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. I like that. The Lord was with Joseph. There are times in your life where you've been in the pit. You've had some pit experiences, have you not? That's the way you feel. If I were to ask you when you went through this time in your life, what was it like? I was in the pit. Couldn't get out. Couldn't find my way. As you look back at those pit experiences, the Lord was with you. The Lord was with me. And that's the whole point of the story, that whether you go, you see, from being the preferred son to the pit, to Potiphar, to the prison, to the palace, the Lord was with him. And he's with you also. Father, we thank you for our time together today in your word. We thank you for life lessons in the story of Joseph many, many principles that we can glean from. You said these things were written for our learning that we won't make the same mistakes. I pray this morning for those who struggle to blended families and uh, trying to figure it out, trying to get that love right, that godly love right, and uh, need to be encouraged this morning. Maybe I came from one of those experiences came from a blended family, had brothers and sisters, we didn't have the same parents, we step brothers and sisters, or maybe a wife that has taken on her husband's children, or husband taking on his wife's children, and trying to figure out this baby, trying to figure out this son, this daughter. What do we do with her, Lord? That she's not responsible, and yet here we are together, we got to show love, the love of God, the love of Christ, and so the sacrifice. And so give wisdom, give discernment to those parents, those families, those individuals who come out of those families, Father. We see, Joseph, that that doesn't change. That the consequences of your birth are not greater than the God of your life. God has a purpose, a plan. And the ultimate plan is that All the things in your life he's going to use together and they're going to work for good to make you more like Jesus. To make me more like Jesus. And we want to say thank you for that. That even though people may have intentionally meant it for evil, Joseph learned, no, no, no. God meant this for good. This is how God has chose me to get to the place where you all bow down 
I'm going to be the ruler in the place that's going to sustain your life. Oh, if I had looked at the pathway, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have seen and wouldn't have chose the pit. I wouldn't have chose the prison or Potiphar's house. I, I had no, no idea that I'd be the preferred child in the family, but, but here I was born. God used all that, all of that, to achieve his purpose for my life. We're so thankful, Lord, that, that all, all the things that happened to me were good. But they're all going to work together somehow for your good plan for my life. And to that I say thank you for your sovereignty as we see in the story. Help us with hatred and anger towards one another. Bitterness will rise up like a root in us, your word says. And so, help us not to let the sun go down. Help us not to hate each other, Lord. How can we say we love God whom we haven't seen and hate our brother who we see? Help us, Lord, to give space to anger because the devil's always lurking, likes to ride that emotion. And so help us, Lord, as a, in our homes, in our families, in our church, in our community, in our society. Then we have a history of people selling one another. And so help us, Lord, to do our very best to let the light shine, people taste the salt, as you said, that by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Help us to honor one another. To say, I value you. I value the image of God in you just as a human being. But especially to those in the household of faith. Take your word activate in our life. Help us to use it today for your glory in Jesus' name. While every head is bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. There might be someone here you've never trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior. God loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, we want to take you to the Word of God and show you how to be saved. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me. You buried and rose again. Come into my life and save me. He's always knocking at the door, ready to come in. May the day be the day of your salvation. Maybe you're already a Christian. You're without a church home. We'd love to have you in our family. We're not a perfect family, but I'll tell you this. We are striving to be more like Jesus Christ. He has changed us. We're wanting to live for him. We'd love to have you as part of that family. Won't you come? Or maybe you're just someone now, and the Holy Spirit through the message has been speaking to your heart. Don't grieve him. Quench him. Yield to him. You, want, you need prayer. We have prayer warriors that pray for you about any area of your life. Won't you come? Let's all stand together as our deacons and deaconess and Prayer warriors come, they're waiting for you to greet you. Let's honor him as Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Would you come, salvation membership. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee. Shall bow every tongue confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Ladies, don't forget the women's ministry breakfast. Please sign up. Those on the ministry team in room three.